Hallo, einen wunderschönen guten Abend äh, wieder bei Wissenschaft fürs Wohnzimmer mit meinen drei bezaubernden Kollegen heute Abend. Wir haben heute zwei Premieren zu feiern. Ich bin sehr glücklich. Ähm, die erste Premiere wäre, dass wir tatsächlich 200 Abonnenten haben. Wer hätte damit gerechnet? Wir freuen uns. Danke fürs Zuschauen. Die zweite Premiere und der Grund, warum ich jetzt auch ins Englische wechseln werde, ist, dass wir heute zum ersten Mal einen internationalen Talk haben wollen, um mal zu schauen, wie viele Leute da draußen auch aus anderen Ländern zu gucken, die vielleicht nicht dieser unglaublich komplizierten deutschen Sprache richtig sind. So, um, this why I'm changing to English now. So, um, happy for all you guys uh, that, that join in from, from all over the world, I hope, um, for, for Kami's talk. Um, The cool thing about the international talk today is that we'll take questions actually in three languages. So um, please feel free to ask us questions in German, uh, English, of course. And um, yeah, we also have the Spanish speaking crowd here. So don't worry. Also, you can ask us questions in Spanish. I will try to do our best to translate them into English. Um, also, uh, hello to all the Red Sox fans out there from Boston. I hope you join too. And um, now, Corinna, Elena, please present yourselves because, um, before Kami starts. Yes, I go on. Um, my name is Elena. I work also at the AVI. I do sea ice reconstructions in Antarctica. That means that I am looking uh, into the past and see uh, how the sea ice was in the past. Yeah. And um, I arranged some uh, confetti here right now. I did some chaos. And if you have any questions or you don't understand anything um, during the presentation, you can ask and I will assist you in the chat. Great, thank you. And I'm Corina. Uh, I'm also working at the Alfred Wigner Institute and I'm working on um, native oyster restoration. So. We are working on bringing the native oyster, the European oyster, back into the German North Sea. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about uh, what's happening with the Red Sox. So I give it to Kami and hope it's a good presentation for you. Yeah, vielen Dank und dann hallo zusammen und hello to everybody. Hola a todos. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today because yeah, I have the honor to be the first international Wissenschaft von Zimmer. So that's super awesome. And yeah, I am a biologist uh, doing part of my PhD in Alfred Wegener Institute. That's why today I'm locally in Bremerhaven, Germany. But I belong to Conice Idea Institute that is from Cordoba, Argentina. Okay, it might be a little bit weird all these things of Red Sox, but why don't we get into it? And let's start. Okay, so where is the red sock? The game to learn about species distribution model. Today, that's our talk. But today we're not going to make only science. We're really going to play. So please, I need that you're full active. So whatever you want to write in the chat, just write it there. Because I also will need that you reply some things and pay attention to each step. Are you ready to play? I hope that yes. Okay, so this where is um, this uh, game? Uh, it's from the family of the magic creators of Where Is the Ball. I'm super convinced that you know this game. I think that you know that this magic person start to mix it the super fast glasses to then you we have to just guess where is the ball. Okay, but for really finding where is the the, the ball, there are different elements there. First, we have a table. This table, it defines the area where we need to pay attention to find our ball. Then it's going to be the ball, which is our target element. Then it came the glasses, which are going to define the environmental conditions of our ball. The way of the magician that goes to the glass front, back to the side, up and down, and all this mess, are these hands mechanisms. And then of course, the machine quality, it's going to determine the probability that we get good, where is the ball or not. 
many times I really think that this is like a huge black hole. But I know that if it is following certain steps, then we can really know what is this about. But okay, what all of this has to be with our game today of where is the red sock? We are going to start going for that. And for that, I will explain you the rule of the game. Our aim of the game, first of all, it is to model the habitat suitability. So this means where it can be our red sock species, in the living rooms, we're going to define where, in the living rooms from Germany, applying species distribution models. So our table is going to be the study area of the living room in Germany. Our ball, it is the target species, our red sock. Then there are going to be the glasses, the environmental parameters. So for example, the temperature of your living room, or if you're wearing in this moment uh, a big boot or chest bare fit. All these things are going to be related with the hands mechanism. So this way of handling that we are calling algorithms. And then it came the magician quality, which is the evaluation way of a true statistic skills that that's a value that is going to say us how good it's going to be our model or how bad it's going to be. So all these are our, our, our elements for the game. Ready? Good. So how to play them? Let's go into an example. We have the presence, absence of the red sock or not. So those already that has already a red sock now, please write it also that in the chat because then you're going to be our real presence or our real absence. If you are barefoot or you're not wearing a red sock, also write it there and tell us where you are because that's also going to help and you will see why. So the presence absence, it is related with all these four parameters. So let's say A, B, C, and D. We are going to go further to explain what it is each parameter. But in general is what you have in your fit, the temperature of your environment, how many people do you are, and since when you wear socks. But as I said, we are going to go further for that. So the presence absence information is going to be related with this environmental parameters via our algorithms. So the mechanisms, how to relate it. Let's say that they're called pink, yellow, and blue. For what we do this? For then making a final ensemble model to combine all this and defining an area where we can find our red sock. Evaluated by this true statistical skill to define how good is our model. Are you ready then? Let's start. Go and pick a piece of paper, please and a pen, because we're going to need it soon. So the first thing that we need to do now is our area, we make a mesh. So we divide it into a mesh and we have each square, so each pixel, that it is called a raster. This raster now, it's going to be the living room. So the distance between one living room to the other, it's defining the distance or the size of this raster. Good. So is anyone there having a red sock? Does anyone reply? No Those red sock so far. Okay, no red sock. So that maybe means that there's a lot of people having barefoots because here in Germany at least it's too hot today. Maybe in Argentina, they're just having a shoes. So also that's important. And then if you want to just write it down there. So at each of this location, so at each of these raster points, we define their presence or the absence. These are going to be the real presence and the real absence. And at each of these points, we relate with the four different environmental parameters. So the A, it's going to be what you're wearing in your, in your fit. So if it is barefoot, if it is then um, a big dick boot, or if it is a flip flop, for example. We also relate it at exactly that location with the other, the second environmental parameter, which is the temperature, the temperature of your living room. Then the third one is going to be how many people do you have around? So if you're alone, if you're sharing with someone, be careful, we're still being in Corona's time, so please stay at home and isolate it as much time as you can. 
And then D, it is, since when you are available to use socks? Which I think that's going to be related since when you are born, because you have fit and then you can wear socks. Okay, if you have then your paper and your pen, please write this now. Write one value, which is defining the characteristics, environmental characteristics of your living room, your raster, for each of these variables. So a value from a parameter from minus one to one is going to be related of what you have in your fit. For example, if it is minus one, it is that you are barefoot. If it is zero, it means that maybe you have a flip-flop or something lighter. And if it is a one, it's a really heavy boot. Then for the B, write a value between minus five to 32 degrees. Yes, now in Germany, we are having really hot temperatures. <laughs> so minus five to 32 is ready. Then we go to the third parameter. So with how many people do you are? From zero to 50 individuals. And the value D, it is from zero to 90 years old. I will give you just a little bit of time and meanwhile say it. With this, we are going to define then the presence absence of our red sock species with the environmental parameters to be able to then know what is happening in all those living rooms that we haven't measured. For example, all those persons that had already not replied in the chat, but they have something, we can say if they're going to have a high probability of a red sock or not, depending on what, depending on these parameters and values that you are just writing down. I hope that then you're ready. So let's go further. What we do now? So all those persons that has a real presence of, uh, of a red sock or a real absence of non-red sock are the, our samples. We take randomly those like 70%. That means, for example, if we have 10 samples, we only take seven of them. And that we use it for a calibration of the model to define and make this relation that I was saying before. After this, we have that with the mechanism or with the algorithm pink, for example, pink says it's going to be a high probability of occurrence of our red sock when the parameter A, it is between minus one and one. So you can be like barefoot or with a big boot, but then you have a high probability of having a red sock. Then B from minus five to minus one degrees. C from zero to three individuals and D from 10 to 60 years old. And with each of these models or with each of these algorithms, we can make a final model. But let's go one go a step further. So in your place, in your living room, in this moment of Wissenschaft von Wohnzimmer, is your environmental in suitable for a red sock? If we see this um, algorithm pink, we have these values as I said before. If it is the yellow one, we have the ones that are in the middle. If it is the blue, the ones that are on my uh, right side. I hope that you have it also in the same way. <laughs> okay, so now compare your values with all this range. Find if your value that you wrote down, it is in between of this range. I will give you a trick. I'm sure that for the A, whatever value you just write, you have a correct. So with your A parameter, you have a high probability of occurrence from a red sock. But this is not that easy when we talk about species distribution models, because there is an importance of the organ of the parameters. So let's say, for example, that the parameters of since when you're available to wear socks, so the D, it's more important than the B, more important than the C, and then the A. So with this having in mind, 
if we have three parameters up to the four, which are our value, so our characteristic of our living room, it is in between these ranges, that means the high probability. What happens if we have two? So for example, if we had the D and the B, that means also a high probability. So start comparing those values that you just wrote down in your paper with these ranges. And then if it is the B and the C correct or in between these ranges, it's better. So it's going to mean like a middle high probability instead of the B and A, which is going to be a middle low probability. If you have only one good value, which is in between this range, then I'm sorry, no. You have a very low probability of a red sock in your living room. I hope that then you're ready for now starting to see me who is having a high probability of a red sock in your living room regarding the algorithm pink. This means, again, three out of four, the parameters correct or the variables correct, or only the B and the D in the range. Then we can do the same for each algorithm. So now if we evaluate it for, if we test it in the yellow, it is also possible it has a high probability of occurrence of your red sock. And then what happened with the B? So what happened with the blue algorithm? It's also possible. I hope that you're writing all of this in the chat because then we can see that about. What do we do next? We were saying we have a 70% then for the calibration of the model. So to define how this relationship between the species, so the red sock, is related with the environmental parameters. Now, we take the 30% of what was left before, so of our real samples, to evaluate this, to say, okay, what the pink, yellow, and blue algorithm are defining as a high probability, is that really correct? And we see this with the value of the true statistical skills. And we can see, for example, that the peak has a 0 0.9. That means that it's like super awesome. That is really a very good model. The yellow, it is 0 0.4. Mm, it's actually very low. And the 0 0.7, it's already defined by bibliography like a good. So with all of this, I'm so sorry for the yellow color, but you are out of this game. So we are going to stick to the pink algorithm and what the pink has predicted and what the blue has predicted. And what we do with this? We make a combination of this. So all those living rooms that have defined a high probability of occurrence with the pink and the blue are considered a high probability of occurrence for our final decision. Or if it is only with the pink or only with the blue, we also combine that together. And with that, we can make a map in our surface and define where is our red sock and where it's not. And with this, congratulations, because you just made your first species distribution model and you define where it is the red socks in all the living rooms from Germany. But all of this has to make sense a little bit with what I'm working. Okay, so I'm a biologist working in species distribution models of Ventix species. And I will introduce, introduce you now with a Ventix species, which is a soft coral. It's Malacobelemnon daitoni. That's a sea pen. It's a picture that you can see here with the red socks because that means that it's our target species. My living room in the research, it is Porter Cove, which is the fjord area in Antarctica. We relate then the presence and the absence of this species, of this soft coral, under nine different algorithms to define how it's the relationship between four 
different variables that are important to our species. And then we test it. And for our results, we have a 0 0.9, which is a very good model. And how this look like? So how this map look like? It is like this. And species distribution models can really tell us a lot of information. So this is for a cove. And this is how it looks, the species distribution of the sea uh, pen. Where it is with green, that means a high suitability. So a high probability of occurrence because the environmental conditions are good for this species. Where it is more like white and pink, it means there is a low probability. So as you can see in this A2 um, zoom in the inner cove of our area, it's mainly low probability of occurrence. And with the variables that we were testing, we saw that they are very related to the glacier. And then glacier, as you can see in the picture, it was in 1956 in the line where it is delineated when the purple line. Nowadays, as you can see in the background picture, it's already more or less on land. So the glacier has been retreating along these years. What this means, with the high temperatures that we are having now and climate change, it's affecting Antarctic areas very rapidly. And then we can see that when the glacier is retreating, for a very good side, it's open new ice free, new areas that are ice free. And then these areas, marine areas, are possible to be colonized by benthic species, as for example, this soft coral. But the bad part is that when this glacier is retreating, the meltwater drags sediment and erosion the earth and drag this sediment from the terrestrial area to the marine. And this affects a lot, not only because of the light, not only because of the inclusion of, of um, meltwater and then change in salinity, but also particularly to this species too. Okay, if we compare with some other species, this is not that affected. Like for example, against the acidians. But anyway, we can see in this present species distribution of Malacobelemnon Daytoni model that we did, that in the inner side, so in the new area, it's not yet there. So here came the question, okay, how's it going to be in the future? Maybe we have the chance that it's colonized this area, but at the same time, it's all affected by the environment. So if we still have in this high temperatures and melting more of our glaciers, maybe it's going to be complicated. So losing a species maybe, it's a bit too drastic maybe. Super colonizing of New York's area, maybe it's overestimated. We really cannot define what's saying now about the future, but for sure species distribution models helps for telling the story. So if we say how the species distribution model works, in the end, it's just like a red zone game supported by our studious people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kami, for, for the presentation. And I hope uh, we found some red socks. I mean, the bad thing about today maybe was that it was a bit too warm to wear your red socks in Germany. Yes, um, um, so um, before we go into our discussion, I just want to tell you what next week will be about. To, so next week we'll hear from Nikola Stoll something about uh, drilling uh, in uh, the north of Greenland. And you see here this Death Star-like structure on the right-hand side. And I guess that has something to do with what he's going to talk about. Um, so I think it's a really nice topic in these really warm times. And I hope you join us for that. That will be again in German, though, on Thursday, 8.30. So um, I all welcome you to have um, your questions ready. Please um, feel free to ask Kami any question on species distribution, red socks, or whatever you come up with. So this is your chance. Ah. Um, I think there was a question about the raster uh, mm -hmm. in the chat, but I didn't get the question and I will ask again the person and uh, maybe you can go on and then I come back to you.
<laughs> I'm also taking a look now at the chat log that I have here, but ah. so many people wrote what their variables were uh, uh, and, and their results. So <laughs> there's a lots of comments here to go through. Yes. Also, at the same time, people were actively writing their parameters and things. So I found that super awesome. I did yes, as well. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, girl, that's it. So um, the good thing is that then you can maybe we can see that together or you can also rewatch this and then we can still define it if you had the chance of a red sub or not. I think a lot of a lot of people here were really off when it came to the temperature. So I think having B somewhere in that range where that makes sense in our living rooms was hard. <laughs> yeah, but then that's also helping because, for example, that means that, OK, our species, for example, it's a rare species in Germany. Maybe if we make a test with all those that are in Argentina or in, in, in Latin America in general, then maybe it's more possible of our species to find it there. And that's a good thing that we have also with the species distribution model, because if we, for example, test it in an area, like let's say we test it now here in Germany, but then we want to prove it or we want to extend it to another area, we have the algorithms or the ensemble model that we were doing in the end combines the different algorithms. And this is saying, okay, our species is going to be able to find under this, this, and this condition. So then no matter where we go, if we have then the parameters of the other area that we're interested, so for example, if we have then the parameters of all Argentinian living rooms in this moment, then maybe there we can explain what we saw right now, extrapolate it into Argentina and say, for example, then with a temperature of minus two, then maybe I think that Cordoba it's having now, then that's been, or maybe I'm confused, but maybe that means that, yeah, then there it's a high probability of occurrence of our species. Okay. Thank you. Ellen, do we have, do you have a question from the chat? Otherwise I'll have a short question. We have two questions. Go on. Um, from Enrique Neda, you might know him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he asks, is it, uh, is it any possible change in the distribution depending on the variation of climate or would it be due to another variable? Of course, of course, uh, in the end, uh, its distributions are climate dependent. So that's why we define them, the parameters, the environmental conditions to decide how it is behaving in a species. When the parameter then is changing, where the conditions are changing, of course, the distribution of the species, it's starting to be critical. Because as I was trying to make an example, if we have a high temperatures, or, we, or if we still having high temperatures, and then in Antarctic, more glaciers are melting, I think that the negative things of a glacier melting, so all these affections of the marine environment are going to affect negative to the species. And then in that sense, our species distribution model will say, okay, if these are the parameters or these are the ranges where our species is comfortable for living, now that we have these conditions, it's not possible to live anymore there. What happened then in those moments? Or the species try to look for another place which is environmental suitable, or then we lose the species. Of course, I'm trying to explain a big ecological process in a very simple way, but it's totally the distribution of a species dependent on the climate, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and there are two more questions um, from uh, Tiefseeforschung. How quickly do they grow per year if conditions are ideal? So your species. Okay, that's that's a very a very good question. Um, for sure, if the expert Natalia Cerveto in this species is there in the chat, she can definitely write that then better in in as, as a reply. But uh, we were finding even like a four times the double after um, two years or three years of differences. So that means that really they are fast. We are expecting that this species, this soft coral, is really growing fast. It has the chance for adapt to the environment much more 
in, in, in Puerto Rico, we have been seen um, most of the times there and not in other fjords. And um, it has really the capacity or, the, or the, the capability for adapting to this sediment or this environmental conditions of uh, Puerto Rico. And then that's why he, this species is a little more benefit against the other ones to support these changing conditions and to keep on growing. But yes, as far as I know, it's, it's really fast. But I will promise, I will then write it down the, the, the question with a better citation. Okay. And another uh, question is from Diana Martinez Alacon. How do you choose the, the variables that you included in the model that you use? Okay, great. Thank you for that question. That's a really good one. So um, there are different ways. The main thing is that the variables that we are including are related with the species. Anyway, when we are modeling, then the model also, it's, it's deciding which is more important than the other. So if you have, for example, I don't know, 50 parameters, then not all of the 50 are going to be important for the species. So you can select them first because of the knowledge. So like the history of the species. And then also you can make some kind of correlations, for example, or some other analysis that are called PCA analysis to relate which is the environmental parameter that explains more the presence or the absence of the species. All right, thank you. These were the questions from the chat. Okay, thank you. So there's, there's some time for questions from us. Corinna, do you have one? Yeah, I do. <laughs> this is so interesting. So um, I was wondering if you only have a look at one species or if you combine it with other species to maybe find out about the whole ecosystem and how it might change with the different species being here or being there. Yeah, uh, ideally for my PhD, this is a part of my PhD, what I'm doing. And ideally I'm focusing as much as benthic species. So those species that are related with the, with the substrate are the benthic species. So as much as species as I can model, then of course that's great and better. We are, I'm focusing more in two obsidians that are the specials one of the most abundance that are there. Then some sea stars, the sponges. So I'm trying to or an anemona, for example. So I'm trying in the end from several um, groups of species to select one or two, the ones that are more abundant in our area for then trying to relate all of the species distribution models and then to try to explain a little bit more in, an, in, a, in, a, in a bigger view. So to try to explain a little bit more how it's really the ecosystem there. So that's why I'm, I'm sorry, for example, I didn't reply um, very detailed specifically for this species because in the end it's a bit of each benthic species that I know a little bit for make a big picture. Great, it's very exciting. <laughs> There's so my question also went into that same direction so I was wondering why did you pick that species? What, what does it make uh, or why is that so important for that particular environment? But I guess you already explained that kind of it just the, the, the species you chose now uh, for this presentation. But but anyways, do you yeah. have a, an answer anyway, why this? Yes, anyway, this one species, I, I, I mentioned it a little bit, is also very abundant here. And particularly in Antart in, in, in Puerto Cove, after all these changes on all of these environmental changes related climate change, then the structure of the community, of the Bente community has been changing. So for example, it's also depending then on the depth and, and, and the species, for example, of acidians, there are a changing, then before were more sponges, now there's more acidians, and all of this is changing because of the weather, or, or, or sorry, because of the environmental conditions. And in this case, this species, this soft uh, coral, it's highly reproducing. It has this capacity to, to go fast because there are already, Re, mm, yeah, able to be um, to be repro to reproduce when they are very small already, like two centimeters, and it has been found mainly in Puerto Rico. So I will not say that it's endemic of Puerto Rico because there are some 
nearby the the very south of um, Argentinian coast. But there are some other presents, but mostly we can find it in uh, Puerto Rico. So that's why it was one of the first species that we picked out. All right. And uh, there are two more questions from the chat. Um, one again from TC Forschung. Um, the person asks, do you check by diving or anything else if your models fit to the actual species numbers? How do you check? <laughs> Yeah, that's the second step now. Um, so that's why we are doing this calibration, 70% of our species and 30% for the evaluation. So it means like, I have my bag of all the samples. So I have all my pictures or all the videos that divers or with a camera were taken there. I will not be able to go down there exactly in the same moment. So we just say, okay, from all of this back, we just take the 70% to calibrate it. And I keep this 30% and I will not use it. So then I just explain everything with this 70 and then I came back and say, okay, this is my new diving, my new picture with this 30% to evaluate if this was correct or not. So that's how the mechanisms is also like auto testing. Uh, at the same time, it's good to see this through the time. So if I use the, the samples that we have collected, for example, in, 1950, in 1994, and compare it with a model, and I run a model with that, and then I compare with the presence that we found now, or that we found in 2016, for example, then this change is going to be interesting. And that change is not making unvalid or, or, or yeah, like misclassification of our model, it's actually telling that the environmental conditions has been changing. And so then the species distribution model. Okay. And uh, there's another question from Enrique, uh, Enrique Neda, and this is very specific and very te technical. <laughs> and he asked, the dis distribution you have found has a particular behavior, I mean, it responds to a normal one, to a chi-square one, or other. Um, <laughs> I'm lost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, God, that this is a person that I know. Anyway, um, this is defined by the different algorithms that we were using. So do you remember in the presentation that we I was using this hands? So the hands of the machine, this means how all these are, things are related, how these things are handled. Of course, in statistical ways, we can just have different ways of saying. If you're talking about then, in, in that case, then there are different algorithms, like for example, random forest, or then like uh, in GBMs, or and there are networks. So th that's a way like how they are related. If you compare, then you say, okay, how's the distribution of our data? It is just binomial. It's not normal. It is binomial because it means I have a lot of zeros, nothing. I have a lot of ones. So if you see that distribution, we have like a mountain. So we are going to have like a mountain, a valley, a mountain, and a go, and go down. That's what it's characterized as a binomial distribution of our species. I hope that I answered the question. I think uh, Enrique should maybe call you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you have people diving for you there. Yes, it's amazing. I actually, hopefully, if he is in if seeing this presentation, he will be willing for my second invited. He was too busy before. Yes, um, Christian Lacher is actually the person that for our group in Argentina. He's the one mainly doing um, it, the actual diving before it was Ricardo Sade um, that he was doing also in, in the 94 and 98. But yes, there's people diving, scientific divers going there and uh, very good pictures uh, to, to then identify the species, which is also a very laborious uh, work. And at the same time, we were using uh, with a boat um, my supervisor from here, from uh, from Avi, 
um, she was going to uh, Puerto Rico with a boat and then with a camera that there was like the camera was into the water and then that was making a record and a video and then what I did then from that video take it each second and then like make a picture and then we have I don't know how many numbers like thousands or yeah like hundreds of thousands of pictures to analyze. Oof. There's another question from the chat um, from Juan Neda. <laughs> How big is your team that works with you um, on the models? So do you model uh, everything on your own or do you have different colleagues? And Okay, um, I will say that in the end, species distribution models are really a very interdiscipline activity. I will never be able to do this by my own because I need people diving for taking the samples. I need myself to analyze them and to make the taxonomy to qualify them. There is also other people, like I would say like two, that they're, uh, plus me of course, that they're uh, defining the environmental parameters in this superficial area. So we need to cover the entire study area with values. All of these rasters need to have one value. So for having this, for example, applying to statistical models, that's also a very huge deep activity. And then we came the person for programming. And of course, they also don't do that alone. And learning that particularly with one of the guys, uh, Hendrik Pell in, in Abi. Or yeah, my supervisor also, of course, so, uh, which is uh, casting Herdos. So of course, it's then in the end, a combination of everything. I will not be able to give a number because then I really need to ask like, since when I need to count my team. All right. And if you, if you uh, publish a study or something, how many co-authors do you have on your paper? <laughs> okay, uh, so far now for, for the next paper that is there in the oven, uh, we have five. Okay. Oh, so I have, is, I have yeah. 15. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or 10. So far, because, because, oh, <laughs> we'll say, um, the environmental parameters has already been published. And then, of course, then it's making a lot of things. When we are making a new thing, which is really then a definitely new model, incorporating everything, integrating everything, then I think that it's not going to be less than 10. Okay, so uh, thank you, Kami, for that. Um, I think we're here at the end. If I'm looking here down at the chat, there's uh, no more uh, additional question. We're almost at quarter past. Muchísimas gracias, Neder, señora. Vielen Dank an alle, die zugeschaut haben. Thanks a lot for, for joining in. Gracias para, para mirar nuestro programa aquí. En, en Brema Haven. En... Si quieren, suscríbanse para poder tener entonces así otra posibilidad de eh, tener más programas internacionales en Vicente Chafuco encima. And please also let us know if you like the international format and put down your comments if you want more international talks because then we'll organize that. Okay? Thank you. Have a nice day and uh, get your red socks ready for the next one. Bye. Bye. <laughs>